the discussion today and in this series is very much about the digital environment, the concept of the digital environment. So this is both, in a sense, a methodological and a philosophical approach for how we represent our world in digital form, um, supporting science, policy makers, businesses, communities, and individuals, of course, informing how these complexities impact on our lives and, and society at large. And uh, we think of a, an arc of technologies from sensors through to data collection to data processing, the analytics and ultimately visualization um, as we seek to capture the digital environment. And to address these issues and draw on a wealth of examples, uh, I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome the team from the DECIDE project, delivering enhanced biodiversity information with adaptive citizen science and intelligent digital engagements. And the team uh, are, are here representing a broad swath of skills and expertise coming together in this, in this to, to meet the demands of the project. And I think the, the idea of interdisciplinary research teams is so important in trying to address these complex issues. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing very much about that. And if I may welcome then Michael Pocock. Hello, Michael. Um, who, who's kindly agreed to give a, a short overview of the DECIDE project. And um, perhaps, Michael, you might like to just quickly introduce the rest of the team. And then I will hand over to you to give a short presentation, please. And then we'll have a look forward to a discussion after that. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Steve. So yes, I'm Michael Pick. I come from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Um, and I'm an ecologist. I've been interested in ecology for my research career um, and in the ways in which biodiversity is changing, um, the causes for that and what we can do about it, why, why it's important to, um, to us as society as well. Um, and, and increasingly thinking about citizen science um, and the value that citizen science data can bring, but then the challenges in terms of making sense of those data, and also the real requirement to engage with people. And, and the DECIDE project really came through um, some of that thinking around that. I'll introduce that in just a moment. Um, the, the project was, as you said, Steve, a multidisciplinary project. It drew on many people from several different organisations, and we've only got a subset of the team here today. But I'll just go around and introduce them, or allow them to introduce themselves in person. So yeah. first of all, to Tom. Yeah, good morning. I'm Tom August. I work at UKCEH with Michael. I'm a computational ecologist, so interested in how new technologies, new methods can help us improve the quantity and quality of data that we collect from citizen scientists, as well as communicate back to them interesting information about their observations. And then to Susan. Hi, uh, Susan Jarvis, also UKCH. I'm a quantitative ecologist, and my interest is really in how we can use new analytical techniques, new statistical techniques to best analyze the wide variety of biodiversity data that we have. And the final CH person is Simon. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Simon Rolf. I'm a data scientist at CH, and uh, I long with colleagues are very interested in, in how we can make the most out of biodiversity data um, and how we can use citizen science to understand the natural world, but also uh, are venturing recently into, into digital twins and that sort of work as well. Great. And then on to uh, Chatai. Hi everyone, I'm Chata Chukai. I'm uh, based at University of Warwick at the Center for Interdisciplinary Methodologies. I have a, a background in computer science, but I'm mostly interested in, in aspects of human computer interaction and data visualization and how, how people work with data and algorithms and, and how visualization and interaction could be a facilitator between, between those. those. Uh, and I'm increasingly interested in, in the role of data and, and visualization and, and forms of rep representation in society as a, and as an interface for engagement and, and participation. Um, and last but definitely not least, Rachel. Thanks, Michael. I'm Rachel Pateman. I work at the Stockholm Environment Institute at the University of York. Um, I'm representing the, the social science team on the projects. So that was myself, Alison Dyke, Sarah West, and Jennifer Rao Williams. 
um, and we have a, a citizen science research group at SCI and we're primarily interested in the impacts that arise from citizen science and particularly thinking about um, that from the perspective of participants in citizen science. Brilliant. Oh, thanks very much everyone. Well Michael, perhaps you have a few few slides to set us set us going then, do you? I do indeed. So I'll share my screen. And then put that, put that in the mode so you can see everything. Hmm. There we go. Yeah, so the the aim of the Decide project, and Steve, you gave it its long title, but um, it's really about this precision or targeted citizen science and how we've been co-designing co adaptive sampling and to think about ways in which we can optimise biodiversity monitoring and use the biodiversity data in invaluable ways. So citizen science or volunteer and collected biodiversity data is really valuable and it's a crucial part of the environmental monitoring space, complements data from professionals, from sensors, from remote sensing. Um, and clearly with the numbers of people um, around on, on the planet, interested in nature and the increasing use of technology and tools, there is so much potential for citizen science to uh, really continue growing um, even, even more than it is already. It benefits science, those data, for use in monitoring. And there's a few examples of this on the slides there of, of data which come from citizen science. It benefits people in terms of their nature connectedness and well-being, and it leads on to action as well, particularly at local scales, um, but supports decision makers in, in developing action as well. One of the big challenges, though, with uh, citizen science data is that there's this massive spatial unevenness in records, and that's both at the real large scales, so some parts of the world and some parts of the UK are much better recorded in terms of citizen science than others. Um, but also at the local scale, people are more likely to record, for example, at the edge of towns and the map show there shows butterfly records. And through the DECIDE project, uh, we spent time talking with a range of different decision makers. And one of the key things that came up that they needed was, or what they lacked, was that they lacked comprehensive fine scale maps of natural capital. We can do fairly well at the one kilometer scale. We can do very well at the 10 kilometer scale. But that finer scale where decision making is really happening um, and, and there's the finesse of that decision making just, just isn't available in a comprehensive way. And for recorders, they were saying, well, they lack tools to guide their recording so that many of them are happy to make records which are the most useful for, for science and, and, and therefore for nature. Um, but they didn't know where best to go to make those records. That's set in the context that we can use citizen science very well for that national um, production of trends and for local site-based recording. But there was, there was this space, this opportunity in between. So to put it another way, when it comes to citizen science, the sorts of message I give is that all records are valuable. But we don't simply need more records, more and more and more records, but we need more informative records, places, uh, records from places where we most need those data. So if you were a recorder, how would you choose where to record? And that's where the Decide project came in. And as you can see, we assembled this amazing team of wonderful people who brought in a real um, divergence of skills from ecology and statistics and biostatistics and data science through to the social science team at the University of York, expertise from earth observation at JNCC, um, computer science, citizen science, visual data science. And this was all set within working closely with practitioners, people on the ground engaging with um, citizen scientists through the partners at Butterfly Conservation, Green Space Infrastructure for Greater London and the North and East York's Environmental Data Centre. And so the summary of the project is really this, that we've got observers making data and we use data from over 100,000 people who've submitted records over the past 20 years of butterflies and moths. 
And when they submit those records, it becomes digital data, 18 million records. And we combine those data with satellite data um, in species distribution models to create these fine scale comprehensive um, maps of distributions. The key things for this was that this included uncertainty. And so that then allowed us to um, create targets or identify targets where it would be valuable, most valuable to get new data because those would be the places where we have greatest uncertainty in our model outputs. And that means that we can then have this spatial targeting of new record effort. We needed to explore ways of doing that in a way that was appealing, um, that was relevant to people and actually led to the action. So we explored that with and, and evaluated that. But this cycle of, if you think of people as, as sensors in this sort of context, um, and being able to, in a sense, update the information that we can get, get from these people um, is this, this principle of citizen science adaptive sampling, or it's got that digital twin. We're creating the, um, the, the model of the environment, but then being able to update it in real time. And we did this through a few different ways. So just running through three outputs. One is the decide tool. So this was targeted towards those 100,000 or so butterfly and moth recorders. So you could click on any particular location. This was all developed through a process of co-design. And when people see the maps, they um, the colors identify the recording priorities. You can click on to get pins for suggestions based on accessibility. So we included data on accessibility within this tool. This was updated in real time from records submitted by the iRecord platform. And you could click on those pins or at any place on the map actually to get more information about why the records would be valuable from that particular location. So you can see that it was used by um, a large number of people, nearly a couple of thousand people visiting the tool um, several times each over the course of the last summer. Um, and importantly, people spent nearly four minutes on the tool with every interaction, or that was the average at least. Um, and so clearly people were interacting and using the tool. And as I said, we're going through a process of evaluation now. But just there's a quote there, being able to see how impactful my recording can be Directing me to where recording can have the greatest impact is immensely powerful and motivating. One of the other things that we wanted to explore was that was a tool which people could go to and use when they wanted, but can we actually proactively push feedback to people and do that in a personalised way? And so 850 people signed up to receive weekly data stories during last summer about the impact of their recording. So these were tools or these were emails which were sent personalized. And we actually developed a range of different data stories as, as um, Simon and Tom called them, testing the appeal to different types of motivations. Um, are people more motivated by collaboration or competitiveness? Um, and so we're exploring that, that um, data now um, in terms of the evaluation. Through this all, we one of the one of the challenges with this is that people can go out and they can record butterflies quite easily, but moths are just that bit more tricky. They fly at night, and light traps are a, a great tool for being able to record moths. But typically, they either need to be plugged into the mains or they run off generators. And what we did was um, working with um, some collaborators over in the Netherlands, we developed these portable moth traps and, and deployed them in networks, particularly in um, Yorkshire and in London. So networks of volunteers were going out with these portable moth traps, which were, which were running off um, mobile phone chargers, uh, there's um, power packs, mobile phone power packs, which suddenly opens out this opportunity for more moth recording. And then, as I said, we, we really focused this around the needs of the data users. And so we've developed this tool um, based on discussions with um, the, uh, the data users and the decision makers and, at different scales to be able to provide this information back to people in terms of these fine scale maps of 
of the distribution and, and the biodiversity importance of different areas. We did this building on different case different case studies, um, sort of thinking about how this needs to, or how this would be valuable in being implemented within people's working practices. And finally, um, Steve, you introduced the whole thing of um, data and the digital environments that we're in. Well, how, how actually do we make sense of this? It feels like quite, can feel like quite a cold, quite hard clinical concept. And what we wanted to do is work with artists. And so we ran this installation last December, working with a painter and sculptor and a poet. And so we created this data sets dream to, and we invited people to join artists and scientists in the woods at Orleans House Gallery to explore what happens when we turn nature into data. So thinking about that relationship of nature in this highly digitized world, uh, if the data could talk, what would it say to us in this time of declining populations of our beautiful butterflies and moths? And this was a really revealing project to run alongside this side, which really, I think, gave um, warmth to this concept of, of data and, and a digital environment. So I'll leave it there and let you, Steve. Oh, that's, that's, that's fantastic. I, I think people will be interested to uh, to know how to find out more about the uh, data set stream. That, that's fascinating, actually, the idea of bringing artists and poets alongside sci scientists. It's very interesting. Um, I mean, I, I'm really struck by your, your comment about we don't just want to collect more data. It seems we have so much data these days, and it's, it's really about trying to decide where to where to actually get those records from. So, of course, your, your project is very, very wisely named, of course. Um, and, and I suppose, you know, the citizen science is something that is is a concept that is becoming aware. And, and there's obviously one or two flagship things like RSPBs, Garden Watch, that seem to make their way onto the, uh, the news and so everyone's aware that they can collect data, but perhaps not always quite understanding what the data is for or how, how the data meets the various environmental challenges that, that, uh, that, that exist. And I mean, maybe we could start off by just asking you, uh, the team, what, what, the, what is the challenge that you're actually trying to address with, with the DECIDE project? And um, how does that, you know, how does this challenge affect affect all of us, our, our lives and society at large? So I think if I go on that, there's there's a I see sort of two things. One, you you just sort of touched on there about your citizen scientists doing the big garden bird watch, and we we kind of owe it to citizen scientists who are giving up their time to collect data to ensure that they're collecting the data that is most valuable for the questions we're trying to answer. Uh, you know, traditionally it's it's data is collected in quite an ad hoc fashion people go kind of wherever they want whenever they want and kind of record what they see but we know that a lot of people are motivated by their shared ambitions for conservation ambitions that we share as well and so things like the decide project kind of help to ensure that they really are contributing in in the best way they can i think the second thing i'd point to is you know the current government has big ambitions for land in the uk it has ambitions for building homes it has ambitions for conserving uh, conserving land um it has ambitions for growing woodland area etc all these things require decisions to be made about where things are going to happen mm -hmm. and it's you know when you try and make those decisions at the national scale you know where are we going to put all these things um the, the empirical data on on where biodiversity is can be lacking at that at the fine resolution but at national scale but models can be used to fill in some of those gaps and really what decided to try and do is try and make those models as good as they can be by getting the data where they need where, where it's needed so that we can make predictions about what is what are in those locations well you've said you've certainly had a very encouraging uptake and, and you michael you're showing that thousands of people have, have used the tools that you've put together which is really tremendous and and of course the these tools utilize digital approaches and of course this whole program is about the, the the digital environment the representation of 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 the world around us in in digital ways now it's fascinating talking to all of the the project teams for our demonstrator projects about the perspectives that they take on digital environment and, and what that what that concept means and i'm just interested really for for yourselves and for the for the decide project team how does how does digital environment 
relate to to I mean how did you think about using digital techniques to to do what you've done in in, in the project yeah I can come in on that yes um so yes. I think um I think this project's really interesting because at the core of it is something that's actually not very digital it's people experiencing nature and being out in wildlife and that it's in a way seems a very non-digital thing to do um you know to be outside in the wilderness um but I think what's interesting is that this project has demonstrated that digital technologies can actually add value to that process in quite a lot of different ways so partly that's about how people are recording that data where they're going to record the data that's obviously a key bit of the project but then also um how we interact with people around that data collection and also how we analyze the data. So I think one thing that shouldn't necessarily be underestimated is the actual amount of modeling and technical data analysis that sits underneath this project, that sits underneath the tool that Michael demonstrated. And that's a huge amount of work that really re relied on digital technologies, high performance computing to be able to do that because it's uh, just a huge amount of data crunching and processing underneath that. Yeah, right. No, I, I, I can see you You have a whole array of digital tools um, that, that you bring to bear on, on this. Um, and so really, I don't think, you know, without these digital tools, you clearly couldn't couldn't do the project. That's the that's the, the thrust of it. Um, but I, I, I mean, there's you've used you've used a number of tools to 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 do this. I'm just I'm just thinking whether there's any other digital tools that you would like to bring in and what 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 are the opportunities do you think for extending the sort of work you've 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 shown us i don't know if anyone has a, a view on that um yeah simon i don't know whether you wanted to talk a little bit more about um some of the advances that we're thinking about using ai within these digital models and actually that sort of the scaling the the high throughput the the supercomputer power that's required for these questions. Yeah, I think I think what the really, the really strong just dis dis uh, digital component of this project is kind of a, a, a sign of how like the state we're getting to in terms of being able to you know you hear about ten years ago they said oh, we're going to run eight hundred species across the entire UK mm -hmm. at every hundred meter by hundred meter cell. That's that that might seem like quite a, a lot back then, but but you know we're getting to the point where these the tools that we've got. The, we, we can have shown in, in this project we can run things but then i think it also just shows the opportunities going ahead in terms of um new modeling techniques um and there are some things with 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 data in, in the current models uh we're not making use of the fact that that the sentinel 2 satellites are, are repeatedly going around the same piece of um Covering the same areas of the land, like multiple times, uh, and so you could really, you could really push the real time element of these sorts of tools. And I think that's where we're moving towards in terms of, well, of course, within the sort of the new sort of digital twin uh, agenda, almost. Yeah. But um, we're getting to the point where we've got sophisticated models, we've got lots of data coming in, we've got the computing power to process it and then we're and then we're building and we've got the experience in building the digital engagements so people can interact with these and make useful decisions about how they can conserve land or where they should go and record so lot, lots of uh, development opportunities in, in the future perhaps as well I, I was also struck um tom i think in your um in your talk you you, you in your introduction there you you mentioned the uh, the role of the, the government thinking about um competing multiple uses for land and i think i think you know what the role of tools like this and helping to inform policy makers and decision makers is 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 key and i just i just wondered whether your what your you know team what your observations are on using tools like this to support policy makers trying to make actually quite difficult decisions about allocations and and strategic decisions about planning resource planning and so on What's the role of the tools like this in, in supporting in supporting that? Yeah, I'll make a start and then others might want to might want to chip in. So we, we did have some stakeholder engagement with the sorts of people who, who would use this data. So it's kind of local local government typically making decisions about, 
you know, where infrastructure uh, are or, or making planning decisions. One of the things that we we're really keen on was, was not only providing data on where species are, but also that uncertainty. Uncertainty actually underpins the vast majority of what we're doing in this, right? We're trying to minimize, minimize uncertainty through data collection. There's also about effectively communicating that uncertainty to these end users, you know, to say, you know, we, we maybe we can make some good recommendations about what biodiversity is in locations X and Y, but over here in A and B actually we're quite uncertain. And, and then that puts the onus on them um, to you know, contract surveys and those sorts of things. But I wonder if maybe Rachel, you might want to say something about these sort of stakeholder groups. Yeah, so um, my colleague Alison Dyke uh, led the strand of work on um, engaging with different stakeholders in terms of understanding their needs around what types of data that they need, what um, what do they use them for? What scale do they need it at? But also these challenges, as Tom said, around interpreting model data versus raw data. And that's something that was really highlighted in those um, interviews and subsequent workshops that we had was, yes, we can provide people with these outputs, but actually what we also need to provide them with is the support in terms of understanding these different types of data that they might not be um, used to working with. And that's kind of our responsibility when yes. we're putting these things out there to, to be able to give them that kind of context as well in terms of how, how they use that data. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a, a point around, we don't, we don't at this point expect models to be replacing data we expect them to be supplementing and they're two source of information that you use alongside each other and they've got their strengths and their weaknesses uh, and one actually the key use cases were identified was the idea of being able to use the model data to then scope where you would then go and collect um, actual data from 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 in-person surveys so i think they work the sort of model data and real and, and collected data work well in, in tandem okay well, thank thanks and well i I was actually my, my, my next um, I, I'm intrigued by this idea of uh, sampling in different areas, sort of filling in areas. But I, I see actually there's a question from David Hopper. Thank you very much. For, Hooper, sorry. And uh, thank you very much for your question. And let, let me put this to you all. So David asks, I submit lots of insect data to iRecord covering a range of orders, not not just uh, Lepidoptera. And I typically target locations that are either close to where they live and work or why they expect to see a wide range of insects and so the question is how would you persuade an enthusiast like david to go elsewhere based on a subset uh, of of interest so you know if you if you've identified an area that needs to be filled in how are you going to get enthusiasts like david to go and collect data in those other in the other areas and what what can you do with your digital tools to encourage that well i think you might be coming on to talk a bit more about this in terms of the co-design mm. um, elements of this project later in the conversation, Steve. But um, I think it really shows the importance of co-design um, within this project that we we did end up with quite a deep understanding of those sorts of things which might motivate recorders. Rachel, would you like to say a bit more about that? So uh, the, the strand of uh, work that we were doing at York started with a, a series of interviews with different types of recorder. So these were um, recorders that we selected through um, the kind of local recording uh, network. And we chose them to represent lots of different types of recorders. So people that like to record over a large area or just in, the, in a local patch, people that are recording for a long time or, or are very new to recording. We had uh, an urban centre in London and we had a rural centre in, in Yorkshire as well. And we did a series of interviews with them, asking them about things like how they got into doing biological recording, where they record, how they make choices about where they record and when. And I think what that highlighted to us was there are a huge number of different types of recorder. I think we did 35 interviews and I would say every single person you could class as a different type a different, of recorder. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and that also is reflected uh, in their motivations, but also in their behaviours. So some people are motivated because they want to, uh, to stop a development on a particular patch and they're really motivated by just getting lots of data from that patch. Sure. Some people just want to go out and have a nice time and photograph some butterflies and so they go to places where they're more likely to see, see nice butterflies. So I think what that highlighted to us was we need to tap into the right type of recorder and this tool that we're promoting, which is 
helping people to, to direct their recording to places where it's most beneficial for this modeling, that's not going to suit everybody. And that's fine. Mm. Mm. Because actually what some of the analysis that we've done has shown is that we only need to redirect actually quite a small fraction of our recording to have quite a big impact for our the, the quality of our models. So if we can tap into that, that subset of recorders and we can persuade them just to redirect a small amount of their recording effort, actually the benefit in terms of the modelling will be quite significant. Yes, I was, I was very struck by the, yeah, that's interesting, I was very struck by the comments um michael i think you made at the beginning about whether you have a, a competitive or a collaborative approach some people will respond very well to a leaderboard i i, I expect and I, th I think of some other um citizen approaches like uh, Ge geograph where you have to have as many you have to have photographed as many five kilometer squares or whatever it is as possible and the one that's got the most photographs wins you know <laughs> uh, the leaderboard but uh, other people will, will focus much more on where they walk their dog or, or whatever um, no, yeah, there was Sorry, go on. maybe on on that point, I think it's, it's say, yes. quite quite an interesting uh, discussion that also informed a lot about how we approach the design of the this digital engagements that we that we developed during the site. Uh, these these different motivations that that Rachel talked about and 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 different ways people get excited about going to a new place, doing a different kind of recording is 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 quite different, and that's something we we try to explore within the. The my decide part of of the project with these um individual personalized stories that we send we what we try to understand there what kind of um narratives would would appeal most to to different audiences and that there is a lot of difference and that's that's so important to understand those differences and and try to reflect that in the design i think that there's something that's quite fundamental in the in in david's question is yeah. that how how do you encourage that? How do you bring what excites people um, out in, in, in those interfaces? And how do you communicate the right messages to the right people? And that's only possible uh, through the, the core design, participatory design methods that we that we try to uh, deploy during the project. Well, Chelsea, I, I was going to say you're, you're very interested, I know, in that, in that sort of interface between people and, and, and technology. And, and I'm just wondering what, what, you, what you've you know, what, what you've learned about how you develop that technology to to encourage uptake and use and, 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 and interest and enthusiasm about it. So how, how do you how do you do the magic? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 been su such such a fascinating journey and such a learning experience uh, for me. I mean, when we when we started out, we had a few um, ideas how we might approach that. We tried to sort of set up some uh, principles for us. I mean, we, we had this uh our triple a um perspective which was that we wanted to display information that's relevant accessible actionable and appealing but we didn't know what those meant and that that came through the research and and what's relevant what's accessible uh what kind of information people need is very different to, to what we initially anticipated when we started we thought yeah. Maybe we should talk more about the probabilities and uncertainties and communicate that. But we quickly understood that that's not always what what matters to people. And 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 through dialogue and and regular involvement of of those who do the recording, we we learned uh, how we frame the messages. It's how do we uh, build the right kinds of visualizations and how do we write the right words and and how do we annotate these visualizations in a way that people would would understand and engage with i think we'll we'll, we'll come back and, and ask you a bit later what the um what the key sort of learning advice you have for other people starting projects like this but um i'm also struck uh, michael uh, you, you you mentioned um, a little while ago this uh, this notion of co-design and I, I i think i'd like to come back and scratch away at that one a bit more what 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 do you mean by co-design and and how how has that informed your 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 design approaches yes yeah, so chat i began to began to address that particular thing um, and i gave a talk at a conference uh, a few months ago talking about the decide project and i was saying that co-design has been so important within this project uh, maybe, maybe the old way i would have done things is to think within a project team. Many of us are interested in recording wildlife ourselves, so that's fine. We, we know roughly the sorts of things we're aiming for. 
we would design a tool um, we would perfect the tool we would then put it out there for feedback and i'll get really upset if people didn't absolutely love it so instead we adopted this process of co-design right from the beginning and um, developing this and um, rich berkmar who's doing a lot of the technical design of the tool uh, said that it was quite a different way for him to work and he had to adapt his working style to be prepared to come up with very rough wireframes and prototypes and Chatai and Greg McInerney from Warwick also led us through this process. So doing it in a very sort of basic way and then doing it with a trusted group of people. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so one of the questions I was asked at this conference was somebody said, well, how... How different would it have been if you didn't do co-design? And my answer was, I, I genuinely don't know. All I know is that it would have been very different because it's almost like at every stage within the process, we we were shaped by by the by the um by the importance of the co-design, by the feedback, by the interaction with people. Sometimes that was a couple of people doing a walkthrough interview as they tried to use a, a wireframe for the tool. Sometimes it was a focus group, which were really valuable for getting different perspectives. Um, it was also uh, providing um, survey feedback when we put out the first iteration of the tool. And all of these fed together and just really shaped where we were going. So for me, it was it was such a, a valuable experience to do this. Mm. Um, and, and one other thing I'll say, actually. One, so one area where the co-design did really shape what we came out with was... Um, we thought, OK, obviously, um, and, and David alluded it to it too in his question, we must provide people with as much information as possible. Um, we must tell them, as, as Tom said, we must communicate the uncertainty. We must tell them why they're there. We must think of all the reasons why they should go to this site and not that site and, and all everything else. Fairly quickly, people were just like, look, actually, I can make my own decisions. You, you can give me an invitation. I can choose whether to accept it or not. I can I can figure out where the car parks are. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, you don't have to tell me, although we have got that layer of accessibility, which is which is really valuable. Um, and you don't basically as a recorder, this isn't going to be true for every single recorder, but a lot of recorders were saying, we trust you. Tell us where to go. That becomes an invitation that we can accept or not. Um, and and so so that question of people trusting was really valuable in terms of shaping where we went right and i think i think just sort of following that up the, the this notion of the the citizen as a sensor is an interesting one because that that sounds quite um mechanical and and, in, and impersonal but of course you know this this idea of trust and, and respect going back the other way it has to be absolutely systemic about the, the design of the, the tools and approaches you you have i'm sure um i mean tom you you you've um it, it, you, you've discussed this this idea of the citizen as a sensor i'm just wondering how do you how do you uh, and others how do you make that sort of interface with the technology that that perhaps can adapt to different people's um motivations almost in in and helping to collect this this crucial data yeah i have to say i'm not a big fan of that that phrase it's, it's a sense it's no, it very so. kind of um yeah a bit sort of authoritarian and big brother isn't it, it does, does um, well, yeah. and i think that's kind of that's what we've been talking about when we're talking about motivation and, and co-design is that it, this is very much a two-way interaction between scientists and citizen scientists, professional scientists, non-professional scientists. Mm. And so you know, when we're when we're developing these tools, it needs to be it needs to be beneficial to the user, right? I think long gone are the days where we develop tools which are just like vacuum cleaners trying to suck up data from unwitting <laughs> members of the public. You know, now we're we're looking to de design tools that are really helpful, beneficial um, to the user. And so you know, we found through the interviews, et cetera, that you know, people have these shared ambitions for conser cons conserving biodiversity. They genuinely, you know, all the people who are contributing large amounts of biological records, they want their records to be as valuable as possible. And we're creating a tool which can help them to identify where those most valuable places are. Um, I think it kind of maybe looking a bit beyond decide as well to other projects that are kind of incorporating into science, you see much more use of things like AI, so mm. tools to um, 
So particularly sort of computer vision and, and acoustics AIs that can help you identify bird song or can help you identify a butterfly from an image. And these are again sort of technological digital environment tools that are helping people to get towards the correct answer. Now they're not replacing uh, taxonomists, they're not replacing the human brain, <laughs> but they're another tool just as a field guide as a tool to help people get towards that identification. Yes, there's a whole whole range of these sorts of apps coming out now, and I'm I'm sure they're very, very popular. Um, if I may, I'm I'm just going to change gear for a moment because I see uh, Joe Zong. Thank you, Joe, for your question and the and the audience. And if, if anyone else um, listening has a question, please do just pop it into the Q and A. And and Joe's asking that whether whether we actually have the the, the plan already or or. Uh, or, or sorry, do we do we have the plan or already have the database for recording trees and vegetation? So I I, I think um, if I understand what what Joe's asking, it's really you know can you use these approaches for recording other other forms of environmental phenomena? And you know how, what what could you say about the database that's for doing that? Perhaps as a question for some of the, the, the data folk here. <laughs> I suppose the simple answer is yes, there are there's recording schemes across the UK for many, many different taxa, including um, plants, flowers, trees. Um, there are schemes which are interested in the phenology. So that might be the first um, time you see a, a flower of a certain species in the spring, and that's really important for thinking about the um, environmental changes of, of uh, climate change, um, the distribution changes of, of plants, of animals. So yeah, um, there's a ph phenomenal amount of stuff um, which is which is going on. And there's tools like iRecord, which we host at UKCEH, which, which are really valuable for collecting any of this biodiversity data. Yeah. And um, Christine Sams, thank you very much for your question as well on the Q&A. Um, decide team have you got any insights or lessons to share on successfully engaging volunteer effort and in particular reflecting on how to successfully deliver co-design is it all about aligning motivations what what's the secret <laughs> who'd like who'd like to uh, have a go at that um, I think many people actually could give uh, different perspectives <laughs> on that. Uh, Rachel, would you like to reflect? I think I think it's coming back to the point that so it's <laughs> recognizing that there are lots of different types of people who you could potentially be interacting with, and you're not going to you're not going to necessarily. Uh, suit all of those people so it's engaging a range of people in your co-design process in the first place I think so you've got that range of perspectives and then it's tapping into those ones where you feel like there's the most potential for them to be responsive to your tool uh, and engage with them I think in terms of lessons learned about the co-design process as a, as a whole which I think has, has been alluded to um, already is that it it is a different way of working and it is pretty resource intensive so it, it requires it requires time um, and actually we were quite fortunate because uh, I guess a positive from Covid is that we'd originally planned to do all of our kind of co-design workshops in person and we had to to change that to do it all online but actually that turned out to be quite a benefit to us it allowed us to be quite agile it allowed, allowed us to do a lot more interactions than we would have done had we been mm. trying to organize in-person workshops and it allowed us to have people from London and Yorkshire in the same meeting of mixing together and so it allowed us yeah to have these kind of very quick succession iterations of interaction with the the recorders then uh, an update to the tool and another interaction an update to the tool which was really good, but it, it, it did require a lot of effort and resourcing and being agile. And that can sometimes be quite frustrating because you think, oh, I just mm. want to produce this thing and it be out there. And actually, you kind of have to uh, take the time to go through process. the process. And yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think it, it requires buy in from everybody in the in the team 
and a good group of, of co-designers to embrace that process and and go through that process and um, like Michael say we don't know what the alternative would would have been we can't do a test of how effective is the uncodesigned tool versus the co-designed tool but I think our, our evaluation that we've done and the reflections that we've got from the recorders and the project team show those points where it's definitely benefited the, the final product. Well, as, a, as a demonstrator pro project I would think it's clear that the co-designed approach seems to be the one that um, you, you'll be recommending it uh, for, for future future years as well. Um, Charlie and Simon, one thing I'm curious about, you, you've mentioned um, digital twins, something I'm interested in, and um, I'm just wondering if we could just come back to this this notion of digital twins and what what do, what does that concept mean to you in the context of decide and what what are the opportunities that a digital pr twinning a, approach gives you for for advancing the science and, and understanding here? Uh, yeah, I'll speak to that. So uh, I, th I think in terms of this, the, the digital twin aspect is the synchrony of the, the digital and the uh, physical mm. um, and being able to like really create that link is important. And this adaptive sampling idea where the model knows some stuff about where species are, but it's uncertain about other places. Um, and so they you know, direct and then through the digital engagements, direct people to those places. And you create that feedback loop that I think um, is, is one of the key aspects of, of moving forward to digital twins is the, is the interaction between, between those two. Otherwise they're not twins, they're just sort of a, a digital thing and a, and a, and a physical mm. thing. Um, so, so those feedback loops are, are, are important. I'm just wondering how 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 would how would those develop in 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 a project like like decide the, those sort of loops back. Is this is this sort of helping your 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 the, the, the collectors to understand the big picture of what they're they're doing? How how do these loops back work? So, I mean, we, one in terms of looping back with the participant. Uh, through the like they're sending out of emails, I think that's quite an important way of helping people interact with the digital twin. If, if we're working towards a digital twin approach, then different users will interact with it in different ways. So say, yeah, someone who wants to make a decision about where to build houses will interact very differently to someone who's looking to know how to where to record, record butterflies. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, facilitating those links with interactive like digital engagements like that like the minus side emails that we, that we trialed I, I think are really yeah important for that chelsea do you, do you um, have some thoughts on that yeah well? maybe one interesting term i was thinking that that really maps here is, is is this notion of dialogue and and i think this uh the way of engaging and, and going back to people about the value of what they've done or what they could have done differently is they it's, it's the starting of a dialogue between those maybe the, the, the worlds that I might be that might be a bit apart and 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 we've heard the mention of like trust and and, mm. and engagement and and I think this dialogue is is where those values are, are built up uh, and and for us methodologically co-design was to sort of build build and uh, build trust and, and 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 creating an inclusive and uh, an equitable sort of place for people to contribute to the project but i think these digital engagements that we that we design i think that they're, they're, they're sort of quite a valuable tool to build that dialogue between let's say science and and, and society and and giving people uh, informative accessible information but also opening up new opportunities how society could be part of science and could contribute to science and uh, and then communicating how much value there is in in, in those efforts in, in participation. It's, you, yeah. can, you can sort of draw on a familiarity that people have with digital in, in the rest of their lives to help with this environmental project. And there's a, there's a familiarity that, that's the natural familiarity. People use their phones, they, they, they can understand the technology and, and you can actually harness that to, in, in this project. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not just this project. I mean, uh, Susan, if I may turn to you as well, I mean, I'm. Uh, you know, intrigued, and the, the question we had just now from Joe about 
other types of um, recording with trees and vegetation. I, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the you know, the learnings that we've had in this project and, and what the opportunities are for e extending the scope or, or you know, do's and don'ts really for, for the opportunities to, for other types of environmental phenomena that we might want to capture. I wonder what your thoughts are on, on that. Yeah, so I think it's, it's interesting when we talk about other phenomena. So I guess we've got two elements to the project, really. We've got the sort of engagement with the citizen science, and absolutely we can do that in other contacts with other groups of citizens who are recording other things. I think the other sort of element of the project that is quite transferable is thinking about the methods and the the analysis that actually sits behind this layer of where we tell people they might want to go. So this idea of actually doing the the modelling and the estimation of that uncertainty to inform our next batch of sampling, that's definitely transferable. It's something that is being used across other in other environmental science domains, something that's quite uh, increasingly common. I think this is the first project I've known of where we're doing it with citizen science, which is quite exciting. Mm -hmm. But the concepts are are definitely transferable. I think in terms of biodiversity monitoring, and maybe going back to Joe's question a bit, I think what could be really exciting in the future is thinking about how do we use the broad range of data we have in the biodiversity data landscape. So not just thinking about citizen science data, but thinking about other types of data that are coming in. Maybe that's through new technologies, such as this sort of automated uh, image recognition idea or maybe it's through established traditional monitoring techniques through professional monitoring but bringing all of those data sets together and then thinking about how we use all of them to inform where to get those new samples where to get the most out of our information I think that's quite an exciting thing to think about looking forward great thanks I see we're unfortunately creeping towards the end of the the hour so I've got a couple of uh quick fire questions if I may so brief, brief answers. I mean, Tom, maybe I could start with you. You've mentioned the, the role of AI um, as well, mm. but in, in this concept of the digital environment, um, clearly what, what you've achieved, you've, you've outlined, but what, what do you, what do you see as the sort of the challenges that still, that are still outstanding, that still remain in, 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 in engaging uh, projects like this with digital approaches? Oh, that, that doesn't invite a short answer, Steve. Um, <laughs> no. I think, I, I I guess to, to summarize, I think um, there's a lot of new methods being developed, particularly in like AI space. And so a real challenge there is knowledge, knowledge amongst our sort of community of those tools that are available. Um, there's a lot of interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity needed, um, but also there's a requirement for individuals who themselves are transdisciplinary, you know, so ecologists who understand computer vision and AI, so sort of transdisciplinary individuals. I think there can also be barriers to participation, um, whether that's access to data or mm. access to compute resources required to do these things or access to knowledge. So I think there's there's a role as well for our community to try and open up um, knowledge more and, and make things more inclusive on that side. Thanks. Well, I, I think the time's come to ask the, um, the, the, the Rachel, if I may, and then I'll finish, Michael, with yourself. But um, Rachel, I, I'm just wondering, at, at, as the project's progressed, as a demonstrator, we've mentioned this idea of learnings for other colleagues in environmental sciences and, and indeed other disciplines who are interested in taking participating in projects like this in the future. I'm just wondering if you if you could sort of sit there and give us a view of what some of the best practices are that you've that you've established or that you've un uncovered in in your work yeah i think engaging with the right stakeholders so as michael mentioned at the beginning we have butterfly conservation on board who um are a really trusted organization from the recorders that we were working with and they facilitated a lot of our engagement with the recording community so identifying the right stakeholders to be able to access your end user I think is a really important thing and um, as I was alluding to um, time for co-design is really important and having everyone um, bought into that process being very respectful of the people that you're engaging with um, for the time that they're giving up and contributing to something that they're probably not as interested in as we are as a project team. Um, and so having somebody dedicated to that kind of communication with those 
with those um, end users was really important as well. Um, and I would say communication again. So um, uh, we've just kind of started, well, in the process of analysing the, eval the evaluation feedback from the final survey that we did. And I would say what that's highlighted is that those people are, who are giving us not so positive feedback, it's probably actually because they've not quite understood what we were trying to do. So despite having been through this co-design process and doing our best to get the messaging mm -hmm. right, I think there was probably more that we could have done to invest in actually nailing that. And um, I think so having somebody on board who's a real communications um, mm -hmm. specialist and who can help with that is really important as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Great, great advice for anyone uh, uh, contemplating a, a project like this. Well, I mean, thank you all very much. And I mean, M Michael, we, you spoke at the beginning about the, the range of skills in, in the team. I think the, you know, I, I might add clearly that uh, having a, an, an interdisciplinary team is, a, is another best practice as well. But actually, the, the skills needed to bring everyone together to focus on areas i mean charity for example i uh, yeah, understand you're not an environmental scientist of course so um you, you're you know working working alongside all the all, all the other colleagues so how, how have you how have you done that michael just to fin finish the last last question how have you how have you done that <laughs> um i think one of the things um that has been really valuable is not to have things too siloed within the project as a research project it's quite easy to go okay the computer scientists off you go and do your thing um, and social scientists go and do your thing and then we'll come together at the end. Um, but we've had such regular communication. I think the team has been large enough to really have that breadth, but small enough to enable a huge amount of um, interaction through our, our regular meetings, but also through um, sort of subtask meetings where we were genuinely trying to get this, get this engagement across disciplines. And I think bringing in people who have that expertise and engagement, as Rachel was saying, and not undervaluing that. So we ended up with a someone part-time who did engagement on the project, and they were absolutely superb in terms of being able to communicate and the blogs and the Twitter and engaging and once again, bringing people so much together and working with the partners. But right. all of this, I guess, is also, a lot of it is driven by the fact that there's a, a huge number of people out there who really care about nature who right. want to do something and the citizen science is a way for them to engage with nature and then you've also got um, organizations and governments at different scales from local to regional who are faced with this as Tom said all these competing pressures um, for food for climate change for biodiversity for health for well-being all these sorts of things and being able to bring these together and and, and have a, a small step towards supporting all of these agendas i think it's been really motivating for us as a team great well th thank you for that um almost a sort of a closing closing statement there um i'm afraid that's really all we've got time for this week and uh, looking at the clock um it remains for me to thank very much all of all of you the the, the panelists who've joined us from the decide project thank you so much for your time thank you very much to the audience as well and uh, to, for the questions that came in that that's great it's been a great discussion as we've we've gone through um trying to understand how digital environment um is used in in this context for for citizen science and there's been some great great examples of that so thank you very much